ladies and gentlemen, Gwyn Thomas was a man who lived and wrote about a world that I understood and still understand. Like me, he came from the Welsh valleys. Well, I had to leave to achieve my aims and ambitions. But Gwyn, after a brief visit to Oxford and then to Spain, neither of which experiences he relished much, came back to South Wales, Barry, and then, with the dawning of the age of television, suddenly became famous with his description of valley life. He wrote books, he broadcast, and he wrote plays. Glyn Hoosen started his acting career as an army entertainer in a show which inspired the series It Ain't Half Hotman. He's recently been playing a leading part in Ballroom, a major HTV drama set in the South Wales Valleys, and still very much in these South Wales Valleys. Here, as Gwyn Thomas, will you please welcome Glyn Hoosen in Chunks and Chips. That strange, small, demonic, lovable man, that genius, uh, Dullan Thomas, once said that beyond the town where he was born and grew up, that ugly, lovely town of Swansea, crawling and sprawling by its long and splendid curving shore, that beyond this sea town that was his world, he could see hills that sheltered a strange Wales. A Wales full, as far as he knew, of choirs, football teams, and sheep. A strange Wales where people in storybook tall hats and red flannel petticoats went about their business, which he said was none of his. <laughs> Uh, but it is of mine, because that so-called strange Wales is my Wales. Oh, my name is um, uh, Gwyn Thomas. I am a Welsh aristocrat who can trace my ancestry right back to my father. <laughs> and I was born and raised in that so-called strange Wales, in the Rhondda Valley. Of course, Dullan is quite right about the choirs and the sheep. They give a constant vocal background a kind of Welsh muzak <laughs> to the stark scenery of the pithead winding gear and the slag tips. I'm not so sure, though, about the storybook tall hats and the red flannel petticoats. I've only ever once in my life seen somebody dressed like that in the Ronda. It turned out to be a transvestite from Plantrissa. <laughs> <laughs> the Ronda Valley. When I was growing up there, it was a place where the fields had lost their grace and their lushness many years before, where now the first coal tips sat flatly on the torn slopes, black pyramids set up by nimble-witted pharaohs who had the theatrical guile not to get themselves enclosed within. <laughs> the mountains stare down at you with a grave hostility. Uh, well, they don't like what's been done to them. Too much has been taken away from them. Terraces of houses cling to these hills, with a somber and a barrack-like monotony that even has the mic lining. <laughs> lining streets with such astonishing slopes that even goats have been known to burn out their gearboxes trying to tackle them. <laughs> Sloping streets where so many cars have stalled that a number of local people still think that Henry Ford backed a loser. <laughs> even the rugby fields are the least level in the world. They are the only rugby pitches in the country where the players are allowed to dip their bits of lemon in adrenaline <laughs> while sitting in oxygen tents at half-time. <laughs> the only time the home team ever lost was when the visiting team were discovered to have two Sherpas on loan from Tibet playing on the way. <laughs> My own rugby career was brief and rugged. A sportsmaster once saw me in spectacular flight from a wild dog, realizing that my speed was motivated by a morbid fear of rabies. He decided that my body swerved and my bandy legs were worthy of a place in the school first 15. Now, unfortunately, our school rugby pitch was built on an old slag tip, the subsoil consisting mainly of powdered coal and cork. A player taking too many heavy tackles usually ended the game looking like a feral briquette. <laughs> After being boarded like a bus by a succession of 15 stone monsters, I was soon allowed to return to my former life of indolence and a love of darts. <laughs> Now, I was born in the Ronda in 1913. A year later, something even worse happened. <laughs> yes. The so-called Great War 
It is a war of which I remember just two things. One, that the bread was black and bitter. And two, being hoisted up onto a chair alongside a bonfire on armistice night to sing a song called, God Bring You Back to Me. <laughs> a demented tenor who wanted to have a crack at the same song tried to hurl me into the flames. <laughs> I have never since been wholly confident about armistices. <laughs> or tenors. <laughs> In a family of 12 children, I was the youngest of eight boys. My father was a coal miner. At least, that's what he tried to make out. In actual fact, he looked after the pit ponies. And he kept these animals in such a state of fret that he, he was constantly being brought home lacerated with hoof prints. <laughs> and martyrdom. My mother, a courageous woman, augmented the family income by making oilskins for the miners in a little shed at the bottom of the garden. She died when I was six years old, overborne by childbearing and the terrible oppressive atmosphere of that little shed. You know, a number of people have wondered why, with no literary background, that I should have become a writer. Well, I have no doubt in my own mind that my constant visits to the local cinema, the Grand, shaped the eventual pattern of my mind. I was taken there for the first time uh, by the daughter of a neighbor who was daft about the pictures. I was only 18 months old at the time. <laughs> and my temporary nurse had wrapped a woolen shawl around us. Held close to her body, I watched through and sometimes over the woolen shawl at the flickering images on the silver screen. Do you know that memory is so vivid? that even today I can't go to the cinema without experiencing the feeling of a warm, young, nubile, female body <laughs> and the taste of wool in my mouth. <laughs> I must have spent the greater part of my youth in that black cavern. I suppose during the days of the Depression we needed warmth and comfort as much as any wandering Eskimo. By the time I was nine years of age, I'd seen so many cowboy films, I was a paid-up member of the 7th Cavalry. <laughs> I was more Picos than Porth. I was more Tombstone than Tonopandi. <laughs> and I went around constantly feeling my top hair every time I saw somebody that looked as if he might be a member of the Blind Cum branch of the Sioux tribe. <laughs> I remember the seats that we sat on were the most uncomfortable implements since the penitential stocks of puritanical England. They were benches made out of long strips of bamboo, pitted with thousands of tiny holes. After sitting on those things for a couple of hours, they could have put you through a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have come up probably sounding like the roses of Tralee. <laughs> then, of course, there was chapel. Always chapel. I think we had more chapels to the square inch than any other country in Christendom. It was most people's ambition to have their own chapel. <laughs> Preferably strapped to their backs. <laughs> Mind you, a number of us felt we already had. You see, I was one of a generation whose language had changed from Welsh to English with a malignant ease. There's no doubt now that looking back theologically, we had a very tangled time of it. And yet, you know, I look back on that Rhonda Gothic building with a good deep love. And we all learnt enough Welsh to give a certain passion to the songs that we sang. And even if it provided nothing else, it was an abundance of beautiful, sunlit voices. I used to specialize in songs of a moral and a cautionary kind, like have courage, my boy, to say no. <laughs> oh, 
I would read poems that had been specially written for me by lovers of temperance. <laughs> there was one I remember that went, broken lives would be far, far fewer if God had struck the earth's first brewer. <laughs> That one still brings me Christmas cards from ex-drunkards. <laughs> yes, the memories of childhood, they have no order and no end. <laughs> My father's got a chauffeur. Was he one a chauffeur for? He hasn't got a car. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, having been a school teacher for so many years, most of my memories are of school teachers, not of pupils. Hey, that boy in daps. Get out of the swimming pool at once. <laughs> we were a strange breed, school teachers. I think most of us survived by some form of delusion. There were some teachers who had the warmth, the generosity of spirit, the love of a St. Francis of Assisi. There were other teachers with the sensitivity of chainsaws. <laughs> I remember there was one school teacher who, having been locked in his own school cupboard by a gang of fourth form hooligans, and then having been mildly stoned by the same lot on the way home, <laughs> insisted that, oh no, the boys are as good as gold. Were we? <laughs> I never have any trouble at all. <laughs> there were other teachers that looked on the student body as a fermenting vat of depravity. <laughs> See that boy there, in the fourth row? He drinks like a tadpole. <laughs> he only comes to school to sober up. <laughs> and see the boy sitting next to him? The one with the twitch? <laughs> and the bulging eyes? And the awareness of a stunned sheep? <laughs> he squired so many married women into the local woods, that twitch is caused by fatigue. <laughs> the bulging eyes by a surfeit of carnal knowledge. <laughs> the memories of childhood. But it is strange, isn't it? How a snatch of a tune or a sound can bring those memories rushing back. You see, even now, the rattle of a train means just one thing to me. It is that bizarrely entranced state. When we valley children used to pour in our thousands down the sloping streets to the station, into the trains, to edge out of the close enclosed hills, through the lush fields of the Vale of Glamorgan, to the sea. Once a year, just one <coughs> magical glimpse of the sea. At the first sight and sound of us, the fish moved off a mile. <laughs> to keep a cold eye on the whole Sunday school movement <laughs> that had sponsored this act of joy. <laughs> on the day itself, we paraded up and down the pavements at dawn, sniffing at the air, <laughs> frowning at the formation of the clouds and daring them to put a damper on our delight. <laughs> now, usually they looked as though they had heard us and were working hard at it because that valley was the saddest pocket in the whole done suit of British weather. But there will never be such optimists as those boys on the dawn weather patrol. <laughs> the skies might look as if they were shaping up for the most baleful act of spleen since Noah. <laughs> there might even be a cloudburst swilling the waiting trippers right down to the bed of the River Taff. <laughs> but we were not put off. No, it's for heat, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a haze for heat. <laughs> It's, it's always the same. If you can't see the top of the mountain, <laughs> you look out for sunstroke. <laughs> now, don't take your coats, boys, because it's going to be a scorcher. <laughs> Just a handkerchief for the back of the neck. <laughs> you know, tucked into your cap and hanging down loose, <laughs> like in the foreign ninja. <laughs> then we would limp home for a vapor rub <laughs> and a bowl of hot broth. Active preparations for the feast began before seven o'clock in the morning, and any family taking less than a hundred weight of sandwiches <laughs> was accused of trifling with a treat. 
We were the only tapeworms ever to appear publicly in blue shirts. <laughs> And appetites were sharp. Even as we walked down to the vestry for our tickets. Hey, Dad, can I have a sandwich, Dad? <laughs> Dad, can I have a sandwich, one of the roast porks? Bloodwin, Mervyn wants a roast pork. A roast pork? The dearest and the best. Oh, God. All right, give him one. But don't let him get at the fruit. He's a terror for the fruit. You know what happened last year? We let him get into the bag and flow in the beer. He was sick in both, he had to get off the train in Ponty. <laughs> now, on the day, the station was like a scene from Babylon. <laughs> a real crisis. Because, you see, a number of chapels would go on the same day, at the same time. It was then that the local station master reached the heights of Joe. <laughs> no cooperation. <laughs> No sympathy, no feelings at all for the Great Western Railway. <laughs> Look at her. The biggest gathering of Christians since the revival of 1904. <laughs> and all wanting to go to Barry on the same train. <laughs> and there's no love or trust among you. If one chapel went on its own, the other, others would be back home praying <laughs> for heavy rain. <laughs> Ah, there's those boys, there's those boys from Tusaka. There's a crew, what a mob they are. The last recruits to the faith before Darwin put pay to innocence. <laughs> if the train feels a bit low and bumpy when it pulls into Barry, it'll be those boys. They will have stolen the wheels. <laughs> riffs, that's what they are, definitely riffs. They could, should have gone by special camel at dawn. No. On a really crowded day, the slogan for each compartment was push him in, push him in as tight as you can. We can always winkle you out of the woodwork in Barry. <laughs> now, this explains the superb breath control of many Ronda vocalists. <laughs> it's true. Because on a really crowded day, they would inhale deeply in Penny Gry. <laughs> Then they wouldn't breathe out again until they got to Barry. <laughs> now, it was a feeble child indeed who couldn't get lost in that setup. Mervyn? Mervyn? Where's our Mervyn? Well, where is he? Well, don't stand there. We have a red flag. Stop the train. Do something. <laughs> well, where is he? Is that him over there? Is that him with his coat over his head? <laughs> well, where is. Ah, there he is. Where was he in us? Oh, he, he was in the next compartment with that soprano who tells fortunes. You know, Mrs. Tetra Thomas. Yeah, there she was, sitting in the corner of the compartment, comfortable and jocose, and I'm in a bide with me, as she usually does at the beginning of a treat, when she suddenly said to Mr. Allard, the guard, Mr. Allard, she said, this seat's very lumpy, Mr. Allard. She gets up, there's our Mervyn, crushed and blue. <laughs> Some shrewd lads, remembering the pennies and the oranges that were showered on them the year before when they got lost, made an instant beeline for the lost children's pound. <laughs> and some of the most astute crouching I've ever seen went on as their parents gathered round the wire fence to seek them out. <laughs> now, the figure eight was a magnet for most, with a very high percentage of people driven half mad by the sudden upsurge of wind caused by the twists and turns of this contraption. No, very often you would find respectable elders trying to stand up in the front row of the roller coaster. Their faces as pale as death, clutching desperately at their layers of surge and shouting, take me, Lord, take me! <laughs> and vowing never again to turn their backs on Calvin. <laughs> the more daring, hired bathing costume. Now, these articles had usually stretched with age and would have given a comfortable lift to a Zeppelin. 
I remember the boys would edge out of the hiring sheds, shyfully, bashfully, these shapeless blue robes hanging from them, looking like a gaggle of druids. who had decided to leave Wales the shortest way possible. <laughs> Go, Captain Webb, don't talk. <laughs> oh, I, I like a bit of slack myself. <laughs> I, uh, I don't like those old tight things. <laughs> hey, boys, now watch this. What's this breaststroke now? What's a peer charge of Western Supermare? Huh? <laughs> Very often, some of them would lie on top of the water facing in the general direction of the Somerset coast, give a tremendous jerk of the legs, and shoot out of their costumes like torpedoes. <laughs> to a salvo of cautionary shouts from the deacons who were standing on the foreshore, patient fathers trailed their young through the teeming, fascinating booths of the fairground. Hey, Dad! Hey, Dad, look, Dad, over there, Dad. Look, Dad, over there. Death of Crippen. <laughs> What'd he die of, Dad? <laughs> yeah. Lack of support, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Happier days have never been. And as we made our way back to the valleys, back through the lush fields, we would lie in the compartments, tired and thankful. The air filled with the strange smells of repletion and sand. Even the desperate appeals of our mothers had grown weary with acceptance. Mervyn, stop breaking up that sticky rock into that gentleman's bowler, please. <laughs> Marbeth, hold those chips out the window, love. <laughs> well, they do smell of <laughs> Prudence, if it's more of that old pop we want, put you a penny on, for God's sake. And there, in the dusk, would lie the faces of contentment, gentle and wry. <laughs> There's another sound that promotes a roaring inside my head. Listen to this. I see the Mississippi and the River Taff. <laughs> Kiss with a dark lubricity when I hear that song. I see those brave ghosts marching in endless procession once again in those long, hot, idle summers. The valley air filled with a clearer loveliness than it had ever known before. No smoke rose from the chimney pots. The endless journeys of the coal tram ceased to rattle as the liberated pit ponies romped amongst the ferns on the mountain tops, mm -hmm. and the endless parade of nail boots upon the pavement fell silent. Then out of the quietness and the golden light, a new excitement was born. <laughs> Don't march so close, Jack. You've thrown my heel down seven times already. <laughs> David, look, try and get a bit of rhythm in your marching. You're loping around like a kangaroo man. <laughs> the carnivals and the jazz bands. They form bands by the dozens. Great lumps of precision, marching up and down the valleys, deafening us with the songs that they blew. Their instruments? Gazooks, or kazoos, as some people call them, with the occasional drum. Each band dressed in the uniforms of remote characters never before seen in the bands. <laughs> There were French legionnaires, <laughs> Chinamen, Carabinieri, <coughs> Gauchos, even Eskimos. <laughs> but the most daring of the lot were the dervishes. <laughs> yes, the dervishes. One hundred half-naked young men, all wearing the legal minimum of old bedsheet. <laughs> At their head, their leader, the Mad Mahdi, throwing himself into the air with pagan-type leaps that threatened to separate his loincloth from his feet. <laughs> there was also an all-woman band called the Britannias. Each lady dressed in a kind of Union Jack and all marching rather unsteadily to the strains of Rule Britannia. 
They were a broad-bodied, vigorous crew. <laughs> Strong on charabang trips that usually ended in a blazing revelry with them drinking direct from the petrol tank. <laughs> Unfortunately, the lady drummer had another weakness. She used to be driven hysterical by the vibration set up by her drumming. <laughs> She used to collapse into a laughing fit every time she hit the pigskin. <laughs> it is understandable, therefore, I suppose, that their formation marching lacked a certain precision. <laughs> but Carnival Day wasn't always a happy day for all. I remember there was one sad year when our local favourites, the Sons of Dixie, <laughs> decided on a bold stroke. They shed their white minstrel suits painted themselves from head to toe in a sort of dark cork stain, wore a yellow straw sash across their naked bodies, and then renamed themselves the Matabili. <laughs> they even decided to walk barefoot so that they would appear more like the African warriors that they were supposed to represent. But sadly, the hot oven day of the carnival was against them. <laughs> By mid-morning, the sun had begun to melt the tarmacadam on the road. <laughs> Every step that they took left a barefoot imprint on the surface. <laughs> Within a mile, the marching Matabili had a four-inch sole of Ashford. <laughs> Those that weren't keeling over were slowed down. <laughs> to a pathetic stumble. <laughs> Well, eventually, they, they were disqualified <laughs> for trying to chip the tarmacadam off their feet with knives. <laughs> because under Rule 17, no band was allowed to carry an offensive weapon. <laughs> the eventual winners were the Abaclitic Sheiks. Not only did they introduce a new kind of slow march, but absolutely pulsated with erotica. <laughs> But they were led by a black turban mufti mounted on a flea-bitten car. <laughs> which they'd managed to get from some bankrupt menagerie. <laughs> well, such flamboyance just had to be rewarded. <laughs> so at Carnival End, we made our way back to the valley. By moonlight, in single file, up the mountain track. The Matabili, the Dervishes, the Britannias. And when we arrived on top of the mountain, a silence and a sadness descended upon us. But it wasn't, wasn't a miserable sadness, because the moonlight seemed to make that mountain secure and serene. And although we all knew that our bubble of frivolity, blown with such loving care, had burst, we all felt the closeness of friendship and forgiveness. Then suddenly the silence was broken by somebody playing a tune on a gazoo. It was one of those sweet, deep tunes that settled like dew upon a mood like ours. It was all through the night. Ar Hedonos. Ar Hedonos orchestrated for a thousand talking tears. Feeling profoundly aware of the self, the one of which we are all compounded, we slowly joined in. It was another long, hot, <coughs> idle summer that turned out to be a bonanza for me. It was the time when I was waiting for the results of my entrance examination to Oxford University. It was a time of waiting, of hoping, and sometimes of utter boredom. And I was joined by a very large number of other unemployed young men. 
also waiting and hoping for any kind of job. One day, Bryn said, you know what we want to do to relieve this boredom? What we want to do is have an orgy. <laughs> I heard that some people up the road had an orgy. Cataracts of booze, lightnings of power. Women approached by men in complete freedom. <laughs> men recognized by touch and ardor. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning, knock on the door, the milkman. Hello, he said. You sound to be on a bit of fun in there. Can I come in? No, they said, you was off. You've been recognized four times already. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the boys decided to have an orgy on the following Saturday night. I met Bryn on the Sunday morning. I said, how'd the, uh, how'd the orgy go last night, Bryn? He said, oh, backwards, if at all. <laughs> he said, we sat around the kitchen, laughing out loud, making suggestive remarks. He said, I don't know. He said, we must have laughed too loud. <laughs> well, the kitchen must have been a bit too damp. Anyhow, he said, we sat there in the kitchen, staring at each other in silence till about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> then we sang for him, shook hands and went home. <laughs> But it was an exciting time for me because I heard that indeed I had won a place at England's oldest university. <coughs> but unfortunately, the local council, on the basis of a rather crude means test, decided to cut my grant to such a shoestring amount that even now my shoes keep falling off at the thought of it. <laughs> a number of people have asked me if my terms at Oxford had any profound effect upon my life. I always give a resounding no. The stress of my years at Oxford caused me to smoke so many cigarettes, I didn't have nicotine stains on my fingers. I had third degree burns. <laughs> and I went around constantly with more ash on my lapels than there was on Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> now, the greatest influences on my life have been Shakespeare, Jesus, and Karadic Pew. <laughs> yes, Karadic Pew. He was the local councillor who, in the bitter winter of 1931, organized our first indoor lavatory. <laughs> Certainly wasn't Oxford University, good God, no. I passed through Oxford in three years, one stupor and two and a half ill-fitting suits. Even if I'd been a visitor from outer space, I couldn't have had less contact with the place. It's strange, isn't it, that for so many men, Oxford remains a sanctified stretch of golden road. For me, it was an endless solitude. Tainted from top to bottom with the taste and the smells of digestive biscuits, meat pies, and cocoa. <laughs> no, my terms at Oxford were, from beginning to end, a series of spinning alienations with a touch of black farce. You see, the average height of the undergraduates disconcerted me. Coming from a Welsh mining village where the average height of the men was five foot five, the abundance of men over six foot absolutely startled me. <laughs> no, I would find myself walking down Oxford High Street, staring into sulken, multicolored waistcoats at the latitude of the navel. <laughs> time and time again, I would look up to see a pair of upper-class eyes staring down at me, looking at me as if they'd seen their first mole. <laughs> Which is rather interesting, because as we now know, Moles were not uncommon in Oxford in those days. <laughs> but in relation to those colorful blooms, I felt no better than green fly. A large number of these blooms had just returned from vacation in Germany and were singing the praises of the plans and the notions of the then emerging Hitler. One of them, an aquiline fellow, a neo-Nazi who made a regular breakfast of loathing on toast, <laughs> suggested that the Welsh blood had been heavily infused with infusions of Jewish and Negro blood. <laughs> Feeling no better than the dark pygmy Toby jug. <laughs> I remember I used to shake myself just to give him a glug of tainted plasma. <laughs> I suppose if I had worked at my degree course a little harder, my troubles would have been fewer. For instance, my language tutor, a small man with malignant undertones. He hated England and everything English. 
and he detested my specialist subject, which was the Middle Ages. I can still see him wince as he helped me to unearth the banalities that lie in the chronicles of Wilfred the Hairy, Rufus the Rough, Sancho the Sod, and so on. <laughs> my move to the University of Madrid in 1933 to further my language studies was no more successful. You see, the university buildings started in 1931 were only half finished and were never likely to be. The lift stuck so often that they used to post a resident lecturer in every lift to guarantee <laughs> to guarantee continuity of teaching. <laughs> all my fellow students were English, all sharp voiced, all brimming with Saxon vim. They all looked as if they'd been poured out of the same mould and they all sounded as if they'd come from the same house in Tunbridge Wells. <laughs> So I withdrew from the rather bourgeois atmosphere of the university and I moved into a little pension, a place with strange Moorish doorways and rather uncommon plumbing. <laughs> there I was, surrounded by Spain and Spaniards. And yet, you know, I had no real wish to know Travel has never drawn me. I could easily have subsisted behind one stone on one patch of ferny hillside. I could have, without a qualm, have spent my entire life in a single doorway, just nodding at people, no more. Hello there. How are you? Are you? <laughs> Gastrically, I stood on the River Jordan. My stomach seemed to be heading for the Valley of the Elephants because everything I ate tasted of old tusk. No, you see, the rich, oily Spanish food had left me with a kind of flatulence, which, if given time and space, would have unbalanced the moon. <laughs> no, I would find myself walking amongst a gay throng of Madridlians, <laughs> when suddenly a bit of distress would catch me and bend me double. <laughs> the Spaniards would stop in their tracks and bow back. <laughs> Yes, it, a very pleasant tableau. So I withdrew to my little room, where my reading reached a peak. I read the works of Palaios and Benito Galos. I ploughed a deep furrow through the world's religions. I read the two testaments, the Talmud, the Koran, the Vedas. I read the works of Dostoevsky, Goethe, Tolstoy, Dickens, all in Spanish. <laughs> I read the works of Nietzsche and Marx and as a kind of Vichy water to swill it all down I read 22 paperback novels also in Spanish about Buffalo Bill Cody <laughs> shooter of bison saviour of distressed maidens scourge of the Sioux at least that's what it said on the covers and by that time believe me I was ready to believe anything. <laughs> but somehow or other, I managed to get a degree in modern languages. And yet, you know, even today, I can't speak a foreign language without feeling that I'm taking part in the worst kind of amateur dramatics. <laughs> it's, it's rather ironic, isn't it, that I should spend the greater part of my life teaching French and Spanish to an army of students who I'm sure would have preferred to have been making bedside lamps. <laughs> no, writing has been my passion. I have written ever since I can remember. I did most of my writing when I was a school teacher. Teaching by day, at night I wrote feverishly, crouched over the kitchen table like a demented Quasimodo. <laughs> I mean, a number of my novels had been published by Victor Gallant, but none of them were successful for me to give up my school teaching, a job which by the early 1960s had left me so weak I needed the help of my students to carry the chalk. <laughs> so at that time, nobody was more surprised than myself to receive a letter from George Devine, the administrator and the creative director of the Royal Court Theatre in London, suggesting that I wrote a play for production at that theatre. Mr. Devine felt, and these are his own words, he felt that the romantic coincidences and contrivances of present-day theatrical convention 
have outcreaked themselves. And what is really needed are the imaginative new ideas that socially aware writers like yourself could create. Well, of course, the idea was doomed to failure <laughs> on a magnificent scale. You see, writers are rambling, untidy animals not given to providing a pointed and a disciplined entertainment. They're also rumored to be oversexed and lazy. Of course, these are rumors. <laughs> no, in fact, myths. But they are myths that have been very strongly objected to by the Writers Guild. In fact, the Writers Union objected to two myths. One, that writers were indeed oversexed and lazy. And two, that their dogs very often took on the personality of their owners. <laughs> so, to disprove these uh, two myths, they decided to hold a competition in a public house between a famous writer, a famous architect, and a famous sculptor. And, of course, their dogs. And the sculptor went first. So he called his dog over. He said, Rhoda, Rhoda, go. The dog ran to the middle of the room where there was a pile of bones. He knocked down the bones and he rearranged them into a lifelike copy of the boy David. <laughs> <laughs> then it was the architect's turn. So he called his dog over. He said, Cabousier, <laughs> Cabousier, go. The dog ran to the middle of the room, knocked on the bones, and rearranged them into a copy of the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> then it was the writer's turn. So he called his dog over. He said, Norman? <laughs> Norman, go! The dog ran to the middle of the room, knocked on the bones, seduced the other two dogs, and went to bed for the hour. <laughs> So it is with this as a background that I wrote Jackie the Jumper, a musical play about the Merthyr Riots of 1831. A play that would paint the full sensual of revivalism, rebellion, and revolution. Jackie the Jumper. No, you won't have heard of it. <laughs> At a time of ever-leaking security in Great Britain, it was one of the secrets that was utterly well kept. <laughs> It passed through its phase of public life with the darkling modesty of a liver fluke. <laughs> On its opening night, there began a series of blizzards unique in the history of foul weather. <laughs> Plays died like flies. Unfortunately, mine was the first one into the boneyard. <laughs> but I was destined to have a third bite at the theatrical cherry. Richard Rees, the Lord Deneva, commissioned me to write the play, the book and the lyrics for a new musical. It was based on fact of a chapel in the Tiger Bay area of Cardiff that had been turned into a nightclub. Its title, Loud Organs. The time, the present. Now, what was supposed to be the opening few weeks before uh, we entered London's West End opened in that the town of Blackpool. And once again, that great critic in the sky was a little unkind. Because from the moment we arrived in that strange town, the skies opened and the rain bucketed down. <laughs> on the quarter of a million people that were gathered there for either the switching on or off of those famous illuminations. There they were, 250,000 people desperately searching for something to entertain them. 249,950 of them intent on avoiding our theater at any cost. <laughs> the rain continued to bucket down right throughout the week. So on the Saturday, I decided to return to my hotel in between the shows. I managed to squeeze onto a seaside tram behind two little ladies who couldn't be more than four foot tall, <laughs> both wearing those red plastic mats with matching pixie hoods. You know? <laughs> and they were soaked to the skin. <laughs> As the seaside tram rattled along the front, nearly being blown over by a Force 9 gale <laughs> that was lashing in off the sea, one lady turned to the other and said, what shall we do now, Edie? <laughs> the other one said, Let's go to Fairyland. <laughs> the tram stopped outside the pleasure gardens, and I can still see those elf-like pixie-hooded creatures <laughs> waddling away to their magic grotto. 
God, how I wish I could have joined her. <laughs> Not only had that strange town induced a kind of depression that only suicide or artificial hormones could have relieved, <laughs> but the show's music, of which I had never approved, had crunched my spirit like a trodden cockle. <laughs> It made Schoenberg sound like, you are my sunshine. <laughs> the show continued to tour for a few weeks, appearing before hostile audiences, but short of putting up roadblocks and gun emplacements, <laughs> the refusal to allow it entry into London's West End couldn't have been more emphasized. Very shortly, the loud organs, never very loud, subsided. The actors, shell-shocked, made their way to the nearest labour exchange. And I, with every fibre of my being crying out for silence, started to look up Trappist and the local telephone director. <laughs> it was many, many years, believe me, before I wrote another play for production in the theatre. But in the meantime, something rather interesting happened to me. Now, I've always believed that punditry in any shape or form, is a vile and a base act. That I should have become a television presenter and one of the so-called sages on the Brains Trust program couldn't have been more foreign to my nature. For instance, the personnel of the BBC's Brains Trust. It was made up of academics, aristocrats and tycoons. Well, I couldn't have been more emphatically none of these things. My father was a social incompetent, <laughs> My learning could hardly define the fences that separated Buddha from Bevan. <laughs> and as for Tycoon, all I could look back on was three weeks as a shop assistant in Selfridge's toy department. <laughs> but the reaction of the public to my television appearances was quite interesting. Some would stare at me in dumb wonderment. Others believing that I had become omnipotent and omniscient, like the accepted public image of God, would demand of me the winner of the derby. <laughs> or why a particular pigeon or wife had failed to return home. And I would tell them. <laughs> Others, with malice, would sullenly question my right to be up there on Delphi. I didn't know. I had no answer. I have never turned over an archaeological site. I have never crossbred a fruit fly. I even refuse to accept that algebra exists. No, believe me, in that company, I felt like sending home for a leper's hood and bell. I just did not know. I only know what I believe. And I believe that we were all struck by the same lightning. I believe that we are all born, we all suffer the same hungers, and we all die. I also believe, and I prophesied this many years ago, that one day John Wayne's horse would become Vice President of the United States of America. <laughs> And I see no reason to change that forecast. <laughs> and I really profoundly believe that the evils in our midst are the national, the tribal and religious feelings that end in the ultimate despair of terrorism. I only hope that future generations will come to see each other in a good, clear light. Without love, maybe, but certainly without hate. <laughs> You know, the strange thing is, although my television appearances have taken me literally all over the world, my mind and my body have moved in ever-shrinking circles and haven't strayed more than a fraction of an inch away from the kitchen of the house where I was brought up as a boy, with its ever-open door giving us a view of a sad and a noble mountain. That mountain has become the heart of my imagination. Indeed is the heart of my Earth's warm center. And I have no passionate desire to be anywhere else. My contentment is today as it was when I was a boy. 
Well, my father used to take us walking over the mountains, and we'd end up in another valley in a warm, welcoming hostelry. My contentment today is as it was then, to be found in a valley pub, surrounded by people whom I know and love, singing songs I shall never, ever forget. <laughs>